Welcome to Plenary 5 of the 2022 International Conference on Sustainable Development. This panel is Science Communications for Impact, and I'm pleased to turn it over to our moderator, Dr. Laura Helmuth. Thank you so much, and welcome, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today um, from around the world, and, and welcome to everyone who's joining us in the future, who are everybody who's watching the recording. Uh, thank you for your concern, for your interest in SDGs uh, and in science communication. This uh, this meeting, this whole meeting, and this this session as well are, are part of Climate Week, uh, part of New York Global Goals Week. Um, so we've got a lot of you know, great great science to communicate. Really important things to to uh, to work with the public on, to to work with each other on, um, to study, to to share. And so today we're going to talk about um, about how to. Uh, have science communication for impact. Uh, we've got a great panel, uh, and this this panel comes about through a, a partnership uh, between the organizations that uh, created the the International Conference on Sustainable Development, uh, which include the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia, uh, the Global Masters of Development Practice, and the UN's uh, Sustainable Development Solutions Network. So those groups have teamed up with um, Springer Nature uh, to do a series called Science for a Sustainable Future, and um, and this panel has kind of grown out. Out of, out of that partnership and a white paper that we published together uh, in 2021 about the world's greatest challenges. And some of the challenges have to do with um, raising awareness of SDGs and, um, and science communication. And, um, oh, I should say, uh, yeah, Laura Helmuth, I'm the editor-in-chief at, at Scientific American, which is part of Springer Nature. And um, I'm delighted to, to be joined today by three just fantastic um, activists, communicators, um, advocates, uh, people who are, who are having an impact every day. Uh, so just to introduce them briefly, you can read more about them um, for in the website for this panel. To introduce them briefly, um, Abigail Caprono Kima is an energy expert and a climate activist, and she is the producer and host of a new podcast profiling act African activists and climate experts leading up to COP27. Uh, Wolfgang Blau is the co-founder of the Oxford Climate Journalism Network. Uh, he's previously worked at Condé Nast companies in Asia, Europe, and Latin America, and he's worked for The Guardian and Site Online. And Jason Maitland is currently the president of the Sustainability Institute of Trinidad and Tobago, whose focus is on transforming societies to achieve balanced social, economic, and environmental progress. So I'm des delighted to be able to talk with them today about all things science communication and SDGs and impact. Um, and I'd like to, to start by just asking each of the three of you to tell us a little bit about the, the sorts of, of science communication you do. And Abigail, if it's all right, can we start with you? Great. Um, thank you so much for having me on this panel. It's an honor to, to, to speak on this panel. Um, as you have said, my name is Abigail and I'm a host and producer for a climate podcast called Hali Hewa. So Hali Hewa in, Hali Hewa in Swahili is translation for climate. And the sole purpose for starting up this podcast was to do storytelling for climate stories, uh, for, for climate stories within African communities, uh, spotlighting African activists and experts. So the science communication that I do, I'd ideally say climate science communication, yes. Nice, oh, that's great. And what language is your podcast in? Um, it's in English. It is in English. Okay, great. So anybody can can go. Anybody who's on the who's who's in the audience um, can uh, can can listen. Great. Um, yeah. Wolfgang, would you like to go next? Oh, it looks like you're muted. Everybody's done Always. it. Always. Two years later, we're still doing it. Um, hello, everyone, and and thank you for having me here with with you all. Um, so my approach to 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 science communication is is I work with with journalists and news organizations. I've worked in journalism for for many, many years. And and the question in different leadership roles was always, why is so much of our climate journalism not resonating with our readers, viewers and listeners as much as we would hope to? And from that, we came through research and speaking with many experts around the world to the conclusion that to, to really formulate it in the extreme, the best climate journalism is the, the climate journalism that barely mentions the word climate, that doesn't treat it as this vertical topic, now let's all talk about science, but that weaves the climate dimension into sports journalism, into food journalism, architecture, you name it. Um, so that is my approach and, and that's how I work with news organizations on, on what that looks like day to day. 
Yeah, that's great. Yeah, every story is a climate story. Yeah. Yeah, love it. Um, Jason, would you like to talk about some of your work? Sure. So thank you for having me on. You know, I'm really privileged to, to be part of this session. Um, the work that the Sustainability Institute of Trinidad and Tobago does, uh, we are a nonprofit organization. Um, most of our focus in bringing um, researchers and, and sharing information around climate and science and so forth has been with industry. We have a, a thriving energy industry in, in Trinidad and Tobago yet we recognize the need to transition and, and you know, really be more sustainable and reduce our carbon footprint, particularly since we are a small island developing nation. Now that work has since um, transcended from industry um, to governmental and non-governmental organization. And a lot of the work we do now is actually internationally um, through collaborations in the US, UK, and some other countries. Um, and that really includes getting um, students and academics on board and, and bringing practitioners and researchers together, um, focus on solving the complex um, issue around climate change. Oh, that's great. And yeah, that, that kind of leads into to my next question is who, um, you know, if you know who your audience is, uh, so it sounds like for you, you have a, a pretty broad uh, range of, you know, the word stakeholders is, is not a great word, but um, I guess groups or special interests or people who just need to understand uh, better SDGs and climate and, and, and local options. Uh, most definitely. Um... Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm privileged right now, we, we are actually um, supporting um, the SDG Publishers Compact um, and their fellow program, um, a number of um, great opportunities they're, they're doing there um, in terms of publishers and researchers and making information available to, to practitioners and, you know, supporting green jobs initiatives, etc. I think the other important um, work that we're doing, and it's something that we, we kind of pilot into bring to Trinidad and Tobago, is working with um, the American Geophysical Union and their thriving Earth Exchange Program, which is really around um, community science and empowering um, communities to solve issues as it relates to mitigation and adaptation. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And for anybody in the audience who's not familiar with it, the um, the Thriving Earth Exchange through the American Geophysical Union, it's a it's a good program to know about. And they're um, eager to partner, you know, climate scientists um, around the world to work on um, to, you know, to help kind of co-create solutions to to environmental issues. Um, oh, that's great. That's exciting. Um, and Wolfgang, so it sounds like you at the moment you're working more with journalists. Is that right? And And what you know, are they? Um, do you have a sense of kind of what audiences you're reaching through the work you're doing? We didn't quantify it. We work with, uh, in, so the Oxford Climate Journalism Network that is part of the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism at Oxford University now has wonderful full-time staff. And we always invite applications and then choose a group of 100 journalists from as many countries as possible. Currently, I think the current cohort is from 72 countries. And then we meet together for somewhere between 20 and 30 sessions every other week uh, where we try to help each other build this, this basic climate literacy that is about the science, of course, to begin with. That's hugely important to not skip the science part, but then also to look at the climate crisis, to use that word, through different angles as a social justice issue, as a geopolitical issue, then also very practical questions of uh, how to process data, what, how to work in data visualization, or then again, other operational issues, how to look after the, if you're a newsroom manager, how to look after the mental health of your climate reporter. So it's a very broad uh, curriculum, you could say. And it also creates a network where, you know, if you are from a wealthy North American or Northern European news organization, 
Um, it's this learned behavior to send a reporter into one of those countries that are already much harder hit by climate change. And that already is a filtered view of what comes back. It gets filtered by who you pick to go there. It then gets retranslated to your own typically national audience. But in this network, all these colleagues from so many different regions around the world hear each other talk about how climate change is affecting their country today. And it creates a very different awareness of what is going on. Um, Laura, I also have a question to our group, if you don't mind, Please. a very practical question. Um, and that is what I'm struggling with is we want to convey basic climate literacy. And what I mean by that is in a typical news organization of a newspaper, there is this understanding of what a general education should look like. And as an example, you would expect from a sports editor that she or he knows the basics of their country's election system or knows the most important writer of that country, if, if that writer is part of the national heritage. Yet even the most basic knowledge about climate change is still considered expert knowledge. I mean, the most basic, such as how does the natural greenhouse effect work on Earth or what are the two main greenhouse gases that cause an acceleration of climate change? Um, and, and so we're, we're wrestling with this definition of what could that basic literacy look like that we should expect and where does the expert knowledge begin? And I'm just curious to hear opinions on that. So is it, is it for instance, should, should we expect from each other to be able to explain the difference between the effects of methane and CO2? Or is that already too specialized? Or should that be general public knowledge, just like we know that a football team has 11 players? I mean, I wish it were general knowledge. I, and I'm sure, you know, it depends on what kind of audience you're trying to reach. But I think, um, you know, in, in, in my opinion, we sh should never assume too much knowledge. Um, I agree. I agree with that. I mean, even when I hear the word SDG, I think we, we, we shouldn't, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, talking of, you know, among ourselves and in, in, in an audience yeah, that's really interested, it makes sense. But, uh, but yeah, yeah, I agree. And I think that's part of the, the mission too, is to use the SDGs in a way that, that, you know, makes every story an SDG story, just like every story is a climate story. Yeah. No, that's a good question. Yeah. And something I think we need to be thinking about all the time. Um, and Abigail, how, when you're, um, so for your podcast, who you know who do you think of is your audience and you must have to have to think about that all the time like what level of specificity do you get into how do you explain the science what um what background do you think people have who are listening to you um so i guess it would be important for me to like go back to how this all started oh, yeah. so as a young activist and um, a young person from kenya specifically um COP26 was my first ever climate conference uh, to, to be physically present at. And going with a civil society badge, you obviously don't have access to a lot of those meetings and a lot of those conversations, especially the negotiations. So I remember feeling a bit lost and not knowing exactly what to follow. Um, I had read a paper called a five point plan that was prepared by the organization I used to work for then. And I knew what to look out for, but then it wasn't very clear. And at that time, I remember sharing what was happening on my Instagram to just random people I really don't have a big following. And I remember people were actually interested, especially from where I come from and understanding that I come, I come from a community of farmers. So I something that related with them or something that they could relate to was uh, you know, explaining the impacts of climate change with, with its relation to agriculture. And so after doing that, I realized there was real hunger for information and understanding why do we need to meet every once in a year to negotiate or have conversations about climate change. And so on coming back home, I thought of doing something that would, would something bigger that would have more reach and more audience. And that's why I settled for a podcast. So for the specific audience, uh, number one, my biggest issue was just the basic knowledge that Wolfgang is speaking about, uh, just sharing that information in a way that members of the community can understand and can relate to. 
uh, to their day-to-day -to -day lives. And then secondly, uh, being that uh, the COP that is happening this year is specifically happening in Africa, in Egypt to be, to be precise, and everyone is calling it an African COP, but you all have the feeling of we can't really call it an African COP if our priorities and our issues are not well articulated. So what, what happened is um, the podcast is organized in three segments. So the first segment is where an activist or an expert really gets to speak about their personal journey and what motivated them to do that. And when you listen to them, you realize everyone has some sort of connection to nature or something they either witnessed the impacts of climate change firsthand or they saw it happening somewhere and they, they, they felt the need to do something about it. And then after the introduction event, now we'll talk about various topics such as loss and damage, um, fossil fuels, etc, etc. And then now the last part, we, we get the experts, the activists to say what their call to action is for COP27. So you see for the first segment and the second segment, it is general information that uh, say people in the semi-urban or urban areas who have access to the internet can listen. So these are people in businesses, these are people in civil societies who can actually use this information as, as advocacy tools. And then the last segment now targets the policy makers in this space, being that um, with the posting and the, the um, Climate Home News is a partner that helps to syndicate these episodes. And this means it gets to the policy makers and it gets to the climate community. So as Abigail, as an activist by myself, I'm able to reach the normal person. And then this, uh, uh, the partner that helps to syndicate this episode now gets to the, to the policy makers and the climate community. So I'd say that's sort of how I, I, I do my thing. And then with regards to the question that Wolfgang asked, I think um, when we speak about climate change and, and say climate science, a lot of times we use numbers and statistics, which are kind of difficult for a normal person to understand and relate to. So I thought, why not do something on storytelling that will allow me to actually go to communities and hear their stories? Because I come from a place where we're already vulnerable and we are uh, hardest hit by the impacts of climate change, yet the contribution is also very little. So helping them understand that, hey, this is actually happening to you and this is because of climate change. And um, earlier, earlier on this year, those really bad drought in the northern part of Kenya is still going on. And I remember in one of the uh, mainstream media interviews, a community member uh, said that the drought that is happening to them is a curse, which means they're actually feeling the impacts of climate change, but they do not know that this is actually climate change and science can actually explain it. So I'd say really going into communities and understanding that this community specifically practice pastoralism. So how about create stories or speak to them in a way that they can relate and understand all oh, our animals are dying because you know the drought has become more frequent than it used to be. And then when I go to a place where there's agriculture, I'll be like, um, the weather patterns have changed. You, you can no longer plant in February as you used to. Now the rains are quite, uh, you're not too sure when it's going to come. So I'd say that is uh, basically understanding your audience and sort of focusing on something that is more relatable to the community. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That's and that's excellent advice for anybody who's in in science communication. Like some of the the strategies you're using, the you know the personal journeys, the call to action, the helping people understand what's happening in in terms of their own experience. Um, those are really powerful methods. And I know um, in the audience, a lot of people who are joining us are early career. Um, some might be. Um, you on a path to a, a science communication career of some sort or or have it be part of their job um so that's uh that's fantastic for for them to to hear about how you know these are things that that you know you can use effectively to make your you make your stories make your podcasts your articles um your news coverage be more impactful and and, and memorable and, and effective that's great. Oh, and we had, well, <laughs> so please, anybody, you're welcome to, to um, add questions. We have one um, for one of the, um, one of the, one of our colleagues at Springer Nature who helped organize this event. And uh, he has a question for Abigail about, um, do you have like a, do you keep kind of a list of, of, you know, 
phrases that are helpful or, or metaphors or, um, you know, are there, are there ways of explaining things that you find have, have really resonate with people if you, if you use a, a certain, certain type of language? Um, I'd say yes and yes, because number one, uh, when you notice the title of the podcast is actually Swahili. So immediately someone sees the title of the podcast, they immediately understand, oh, this is something to do with the environment or the weather or something. So that, that is one thing I used that was catchy and understand maybe for the audience that is not, uh, for countries that don't speak Swahili may not entirely relate to that. But I, at that time, my focus was more on my community coming from Kenya and I know a number of, of African countries speak Swahili as well. So that is one thing that I use to make sure that I catch the audience. And then secondly, on phrases, um, I noticed the more you repeat certain, uh, certain phrases, for example, making them understand that Africa has only contributed about 4% to the global emissions, people kind of get it because you keep repeating it and making them understand exactly why they're called vulnerable communities, exactly why they're more susceptible to the impact of climate change and why it's very hard for us to you know, snap back from say climate disasters such as the cyclones, etc. So I wouldn't say I have a specific cash phrase for now, but I'd say the title of the podcast and then the repetitive nature of, of understanding climate change from an African context has really helped. Oh, that's great. Yeah, and of course, you know, as science communicators, we all need to think about phrases that don't work. Um, and that's so common, you know, jargon that people don't understand, acronyms that make people feel excluded from a story. Um, we, we, are, we have a story coming up in Scientific American um, by a science communicator named Susan Joy Hassel. And she keeps a list of all the things that, um, that climate scientists say that we think mean one thing and it actually means something else. And my favorite example is positive feedback loop. Um, because, you know, if you think about psychology, positive feedback, that sounds great. You know, you want to get positive feedback basically just means praise um, and nobody, you know, your, your first association is not, you know, melting permafrost, which then uh, changes the albedo of, of the, you know, northern climates and uh, anyhow, so it's, it's fun to think about that question in both directions, like what words work and what words don't work. Laura, my favorite example of what doesn't work is to speak of the 1.5 degree goal in countries uh -huh. that measure temperature in Fahrenheit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> We're still doing it. Yeah. But you know, in, interestingly enough, if you, if you come to the Caribbean and you say 1.5 degrees to stay alive, everyone knows what you're talking about, right? Yeah. Because it's it's real to them. So I think the point that both Wolfgang and Abigail is, is making is that, you know, while things may, we may use some terminology, it relates to folks differently mm -hmm. and you know as communicators we really have to know our audience and and, and what works for them and I, i'm reminded um by a community that that i'm supporting right now where um they've done the same thing around storytelling around some sustainable development goals and they were surprised that even though um, you know, there, there are 17 goals, right? Most people could only relate to one or two in terms of what they do on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So I think that shows the, the, the challenge that's in front of, of all of us, right? In, in terms of really building that awareness and relatedness more importantly, right? Yeah, that's great. And and so speaking of SDGs, um, has it been helpful in your work um, to relate, uh, you know, specific issues to uh, SDG for sustainable development goals, SDGs? Um, you know, or do you have any advice, especially for people in the audience, about how you can kind of make use of this, you know, this to do list for the planet of sustainable development goals? Any uh, you know, any ways that you think we can use them, you know, more or more effectively to, uh, to, to help communicate science? I mean, it, it's, a, it's a great question, right? So um, the Sustainable Development Goals is really a good framework. 
Um, what we have found is that, and, and I know many people know this, there are a number of those goals that overlap. Mm -hmm. So in our communication, we tend to put them in buckets and then deal with the smaller buckets. So you have the, the usual triple P approach, um, people planning profit um, that folks could relate to because of course there, there's more um, interdependency that that's clearly communicated in, in, in those areas. I think the, the other thing for us around the, the, the SDGs is really connecting what people are experiencing to what has changed without necessarily using the terminologies. Because I, I think when you do that, people are more able to connect to it. They're more able to then tell others about it. And then your communication strategy becomes simpler. I think in, in addition to what, what Jason just said, and I, I agree with all of that, um, not all of the SDGs, but specifically climate change, when you speak about that, can trigger a, a lot of fear yeah. or a sense of helplessness, of disempowerment, of, of being overwhelmed. Um, and there, there are several approaches. One is, is called solution-centric, um, not only in journalism, solutions journalism, there's also a solution cinema movement i.e. to not present the issue as an abstract issue but to start with yes mentioning the challenge but then to feature solutions that are plausible and credible and there's quite some pushback against it in journalistic circles where then journalists say well so you ask us to sugarcoat reality and to present the situation sweeter than it is or to show solutions that haven't proven themselves yet None of that is intended by people who, who suggest to be more solution centric, but it's very similar to how you how you motivate yourself, you know, when you need to change your lifestyle or something that is really difficult, you look at the why and what you get from it. Um, another um, approach it goes farther and I find is even more helpful that comes someone who's working on that is uh, Kristen Mayer, a neuroscientist at King's College in the UK. And he is also working with us in the Oxford Climate Journalism Network, where he says, especially journalists, but I think the same is true also for many science communicators, rely on facts and figures and charts and statistics, and it's proven and it's peer reviewed and it has been published in this credible publication. And can't you see? Uh, and yes, some people respond to that, but most seem to not respond to that because facts and figures sure they evoke authority but they don't motivate and he looked as a neuroscientist with his colleagues into what what makes us change behaviors um, and what makes us change behaviors we think first our values change through information and then we change our behaviors and he says in reality our behaviors often change long before our values change we first change our behaviors and that sometimes gives us the credibility then to also change our values without feeling like a hypocrite. And, and the assumption is that this goes back to our, our past as a species that we are effectively, and we still are, as we could all see during COVID when we started missing each other, uh, we, are, we are herd animals of some sort. And if we see others change behaviors, that's when we look and say, why are they changing their behaviors? And they may be onto something and we maybe should try that too. So the, the conclusion he drew, and I'm, I'm not doing a great job at representing his decades of research, I'm sure, um, but the conclusion he landed at is to say, um, try to not frame an issue of any of the SDGs as an, as an issue where you talk about the issue in abstract terms, but frame it as an action. Make it a story about people or organizations or groups doing things. And that that is something that appeals to our psyche a lot more than abstract descriptions of issues or problems. Oh, that's great advice. That's really nice. Thank you. And Abigail, it sounds like that's that that's like the 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 in each of your interviews that you have with your climate activists and experts. I think you said each each one includes what is your call to action. What, what sort of calls have have you heard as you've been interviewing people for your podcast? Um, I'd say something that has been very common 
and now is the issue on loss and damage finance. Um, so I recently traveled to a place in Kenya called Isiolo County, uh, which is a semi-arid region in Kenya. But over the last two years, they have not received any rainfall completely. Uh, it is very dry and a bit traumatizing to even experience that. And in that there's water shortage, uh, their animals are dying. Uh, it was quite graphic. We came across a lot of kakas on our way to that place. And so you look at these communities and uh, they depend on, on these animals for income they need because they sell, they sell meat and milk at, and also sell these animals to, to be able to get money in their houses, to be able to buy food, to take their kids to school, to buy water since water is also becoming a big issue and it's a very expensive commodity now. So you look at these communities and when we speak about adaptation and mitigation, there's actually nothing to adapt to. There's, everything is completely gone. There's, there's really, I don't see how anyone can adapt to such a situation. And so we speak of financing for loss and damage for such communities. And that was just one part. The other areas that are quite worse. And so I'd say that has been quite common with the climate activists and experts. And then the issue of energy transition, but um, just energy transition in this case, uh, being that there's a lot of conversation around, around fossil gas in Africa and people have a lot of different opinions about it. And then the, also the aspect where Africa has great potential for renewable energy. But then again, the issue of finance is a problem. So uh, really calling uh, world leaders and the pledges that have been made over the last couple of years to be fulfilled and immediate action for, for, for such communities and also doubling up of the adaptation fund uh, being that you know we also come from communities that are actually feeling the brunt of, of the impact of climate change to a great extent. So that has been quite a common thing. And I spoke to an indigenous person who from a from a big uh, from one of the biggest indigenous groups in Kenya, and they're also experiencing land rights issues, which was quite interesting. And she spoke about how they're also losing their culture, their language, the climate crisis, which are, which are things that we actually never think about. So they initially used to be hunters and gatherers, but then now they've had to diversify the economy. They're now business people. They now practice agriculture, which is completely against what their culture and value dictates. So uh, it's been quite an interesting experience to speak with people and just get completely different perspective about people's lives. So yeah, I'd say that. Yeah, oh, thank you. And Jason, on the on the issue of of actions, um, either that you know that you and your group push for, or that you're that you're seeing um, make a difference. Uh, is there anything you'd like to to share about that? Any specific examples of of things that are happening that? that seem, you know, in the solutions, you know, working towards solutions? Sure. Um, so it, it's interesting li listening to Abigail because from, from our perspective as well, loss and damage and energy transition, uh, the the two main things that, you know, we we, we really push on and on, on support, particularly energy transition as it relates to our own peculiar situation. I think on top of that is really um, building capacity and capacity in, including human capacity. So right now we're working with a couple of our tertiary institutions to really revisit their curriculum so that it is more future proof and considers more aspects around sustainability because we know that's where what is going to be required for us. It, it's, it's where the world is going. And in so doing, um, really lobbying for more interdisciplinary research approaches, because 
a lot of these complex issues around climate change and, and sustainability um, really cross different pathways. And I know there's, there's a lot of different views to that. Um, so I'll try not to put my, myself in more trouble than, than I may have already done. Um, but I think the third area, and just to be briefly, is how do we bring um, the academics, the researchers, and the practitioners together um, and ensure that there's alignment. Sometimes the, the information that practitioners need, they don't have access to it, yet there are many cases where the research is done and is available. Um, but the flip side often occurs where research may be conducted and that may not necessarily be what practitioners need um, to really make a, a, a input in their own specific areas. So, I mean, those are just three examples that I thought I would um, highlight. Thank you. Yeah, so um, people in the audience, please do feel free to, to, um, to add questions to the Q&A box. Uh, and we will, um, we've got a lot to talk about, but uh, yeah, there's, let's see, I think it looks like some have been answered already. Um, so yeah, please uh, feel free to ask questions at any time. Um, so one of the things that I think is a, a challenge for communicating about SDGs, about climate, um, about solutions is the, uh, just the, we're competing um, whenever we communicate with just massive misinformation and disinformation and confusion and distraction. And, um, you know, especially around climate, that's, you know, some of the most, the pernicious, most awful um, conspiracy theories are about climate science. And, you know, we, we're all talking about it because we're being paid off by some powerful company that for whatever reason, the, the, the conspiracy theories never make sense, but they're quite elaborate. Um, is this something that you've had to deal with? And do you have any strategies for how to kind of outcompete misinformation or help your audience recognize that a lot of what they're hearing just isn't true? I'll and take a, for anybody. I'll, I'll take a first stab at it. So it, 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 is, a, it is a big concern and a, and a big issue. Um, I think what we have seen, our experience is that people recognize things have changed. Mm -hmm. So even though there is misinformation out there, people remember what five years ago, what 10 years ago used to be like, and the fact that it is significantly different right now. Um, and that I believe is a strong opening position to, to really point them in the direction that, you know, the changes in the environment are, are due to what we are, are as humans have done. And once you start to connect those dots, um, even without using some of the scientific language, because, you know, a, a big part about this is relatedness of, as we've spoken about, then, then people start to, I think, push for greater information. And then you could point them to, you know, the podcast, the, the, the different work that is occurring and, and, and so forth. So there, there's a lot of room for different players, um, civil society, young folks, researchers, um, industry, I, I say industry carefully, um, and, and so forth. And it, it's really to ensure that we have a, a message that is aligned. I would like to add something, Laura, that may may be controversial. I hope it isn't, but it very much depends on the country you operate in. Of course, we have so many, wonderfully so, so many people joining us from many different countries around the world, and there's, there's no average. But by and large, in in about forty countries where that has been measured, um, the the percentage of of outright climate science deniers um, is smaller than than many people think. It's often far below twenty percent and even less than fifteen percent. 
And um, I noticed that in several European countries, which are not representative for the entire world, but in, in, in several European countries and also in the United States, I think that by now uh, news organizations almost spend too much time on trying to reach the deniers versus caring and looking after that vast majority of the population that, that fully acknowledges the, the, the climate science and specifically that aspect of climate science of human-made climate change and would like to know what to do. And, and so this, this kind of journalism that still says climate change is here and it's real and it's human made. Yes, that is important and needs to be repeated, but that's not the end point, should not be the end point of so much journalism anymore as it still is. We should, we should have much more journalistic resource invested in, in competing strategies for mitigation and adaptation. Um, so that's that's while it is hugely important what what you're asking about how to deal with and cope with misinformation, we can never stop. Um, I think specifically journalism also needs to move beyond that. Uh, because we, we run the risk of not providing information for the majority of our readers who are wondering what can we do and have already signaled their engagement with us. And then as a strategy for dealing with misinformation, um, similar to, to, to vaccines, inoculation, I think is the, is the best antidote, is to inform and to really provide basics and narratives and also provide them in a way where people can repeat them in the bar and at their sports club without sounding like science nerds, but to really break it down into repeatable narratives that people can utilize in their own private life and at their own family's dinner table. Yeah, thank you. Great points. Abigail, is, there, is this something that you've that you've wrestled with much? Um, I wouldn't say I have, and I completely agree with what Jason uh, spoke about. So I'd say just recently last week, uh, I was in a community of women farmers and so part of the conversation that we had was we, we were asking them, what would you say has changed over the past 10 years? And someone would say, I used to plant maize twice a year, but nowadays I only have to plant once. Um, I used to, to, to farm, I used to produce yams in my farm, but I no longer do so. I had to transition and, and plant groundnuts instead. So they understand from that perspective that there are things that have changed and it's easy for you to, to speak to them about climate change uh, by relating to the changes that they have seen. So they'll tell you how initially by end of February, that is when they till land for the first time and then start planting mid-March. But then this year, as late as, May, they had not planted anything because there were no rains. So they understand from that perspective. And I think uh, like Wolfgang says, it's very diff it, it's different for different communities. You can't use one thing to explain climate change to everyone because people experience it, experience it differently. So I'd say um, with misinformation, not so much uh, because we're already experiencing climate change. So. Uh, people can actually understand from their own personal experiences. Yeah. yeah. Abigail, I had one um, one colleague from uh, Kenya who really surprised me along the lines of what you just said. She said, yeah, but w what do I do with science communication when so many of my listeners are being hit very hard by climate change but think it's God's punishment? Where do I even start? Yeah. I, I yeah. Had we're not even discussing whether climate change is human made, but the very idea of climate change happening needs to be established first. Mm -hmm. that, that really drove it home to me what enormous challenges some of our colleagues are facing that I wasn't even aware of. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. The same way I had someone say the drought is a curse. And you yeah. wonder, well, there's really a lot of work to be done with regards to really breaking down the complex terms used to describe climate change in a way that they can understand. And so for this particular community, you see they have different technologies that they really apply thanks to organizations that have really taken the time to teach them how to adapt, how to diversify, how to 
to to like the different technologies they can do to make sure they they harvest enough rainwater in their farms, and it's really working for them. And when we were leaving, we also asked, "What would you want, say, the government to do or the world leaders to do?" Because they're trying to describe COP to them, but in a very simplified way. And most of them would say, "We want more education." because they understand the importance of education. And you'd see a difference with farmers who've been through that, that kind of training and farmers who've not been through training. You'd find them planting in March when there's no rain. And so they end up lose, losing their yield. And that is what they depend on, to take their kids to school, to have food on their table, everything for medical use. So I guess we really need to do more in terms of education and really remembering that we have to break it down a way that they can understand. Yeah. So um, one of the other things I was hoping we could talk about is social media. And Abigail, you started out, um, you, know, you mentioned that Instagram was really one of, you know, one of the ways that you communicated with a, you know, with a, with a wider audience than you may be expected. Um, do any of you have tips for how, you know, how to use social media effectively um, to communicate about climate uh, or other sustainable development goals? And especially any advice, any advice you might have for people in the audience who are you know, trying to, to use social media themselves? Should I go first? <laughs> sure. Okay. Um... So I'd say we're very lucky to be in a season where uh, you have social media at, at your convenience. You can easily post anything without anyone limiting you. So uh, I'd say like really use this platform to make an impact or really use the platform to make a change. And the good thing is a lot of us young people are very creative and you can't explain something so complex in, a one minute video and people would understand and can easily understand without really having to explain climate change in very complicated terms. So um, there are very many platforms we have. I've seen people trying to use TikTok to also do activism on climate change. I, I do struggle a bit when it comes to social media, but I realized that's the only way to actually reach people. So I've had to really put myself out there because I was more of a, policy person I'd be deep in, <laughs> in, in, in papers and policy work. But then um, this particular podcast has really opened up a lot of these spaces for me to really speak about climate change and most importantly, to amplify stories of communities. So apart from using Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, um, uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and I also decided to start up a website, which is not public yet, but now for this particular website, we'll, we'll have an opportunity where people can openly write about what they think about climate change, even for those who don't understand, it's a platform for them to, to really explain what they, what they understand of the climate crisis. And then also most importantly, to now really tell stories of communities, uh, being that, they're very different and the ex experiences are very different, but then creating a platform where they're able to share their stories and their experiences, which can be shared globally. And someone who's probably, who, does, who has not seen the impacts of climate change first, firsthand can learn from someone else's story from across the globe. And yeah, I just say, go for it and don't be afraid to start, put yourself out there. And if this is what you really want to do, remember you're really creating a difference. Even just telling that one story about a farmer or that one story about someone who's lost their is very important and you're making a difference. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. That's great advice. I mean, it, it's it's really hard to add to what Abigail just mentioned. I, I think she she covered all of the bases there. Um maybe the only thing is, you know, there, there's always um, someone or, or folks who say, can one person make a difference? And what I will say is in the era of social media, the, the answer is absolutely. Um, particularly if you share your story and what you've been doing, how you've been impacted, the actions you have taken, and by galvanizing your family, your community, your, your peers, um, you know, social media allows you to be quite impactful. 
Yeah, that's I would great. Maybe, maybe to, to, to what uh, Abigail and Jason just said, um, add two things. One is to, yes, focus on, on action, on what can be done to, to overcome that sense of dis disempowerment and hopelessness that climate related information can trigger. But then also to be careful to not fall into the trap of making it all about my personal carbon footprint or my personal adaptation measures, um, which, as we all know, that can can have this unintended and sometimes intended effect by, by people who use this for, for almost propaganda or misinformation purposes of forgetting what the actual causes of climate change and what the role is of, of fossil fuels. Um, so it needs to, it needs to have that context, I think, versus only focusing on my changes in diet or whatever else is involved. Um, the other element is is to a lot of social media is still replicating a, a broadcast mentality of trying to use social media to reach as many people as possible and not making enough use of social media's ability to create communities of exchange. And especially again around climate change, I made a mistake when I took off from my last full-time role to really study climate change in more depth. I thought I could just lock away myself away and just read, read, read. And, and only slowly realized the effect that had on my psyche and on my well-being. And I, and I was used to seeing horrendous things as a news journalist. And I thought I can deal with any information, no matter how threatening or demoralizing. I had this professional distance. But the, the climate crisis and these IPCC climate science reports um, once you really let it touch you, they are so severe and in the futures they describe if we don't manage to prevent further further emissions um, that I, I really needed community. And so if someone asks me now, what should I read? I still give reading recommendations, but I also always say, who are you reading with? Yeah. You know, find a community, find a reading group. Don't do this alone. And I think that should be an element of social media also to encourage people to, to not be alone in in looking into not just climate change, but many of the other SDG challenges. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, my my social media of choice is Twitter, and it does feel like a, a community or a, a yeah. lot of different kinds of communities. Uh, and yeah, it's it's amazing what you can learn and who you can meet um, you know, with with such a low barrier to entry. Yeah, that's all great advice. So I think some of the people in the audience um, are are researchers or scientists themselves. Um, do you have any you know, quick bits of advice for them about how to work with communicators, how to communicate themselves, um, their own research? Uh, I know we've talked on some 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 good advice already, but is there any any other thing specifically, especially for like the early career researchers? What how can they you how can they communicate better to make more of an impact? That's a very wide question, I realize. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll take a first stab at, at it. Um, so I mentioned the SDG um, Publishers Compact, and you know they have actually put out some top 10 tips on a number of different things, including um, addressing the, the question that you've asked there around um, researchers and you know communication and engagement. And there, there's some tips for, for publishers as well. Um, so I think that's that's a good starting point. Um, collaboration and, and really ensuring that um, the output of what you are researching can be easily understood by by practitioners um, whether it's in your your abstract or, or or so forth and and that um for the the publishers out there i know there are many in ensuring that 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 abstract can can really have the visibility um so so persons could accept uh, access it I think that's that's the big ones for me. Yeah, good ones. I think jargon is really important and and technical language. I I try to read science scientific papers, but often I also find myself 
realizing I just don't understand it. And then I know most likely this or this journalist who is a, sci a trained scientist will translate it for me. But scientists tend to forget, I find, um, just how much they know and, and how difficult it can be to read some, some science papers. Um, so there's that. And then also to understand that journalists naturally look for, they hope for the breakthrough story which frustrates many scientists because most science happens in increments and not in leaps and bounds. And so the scientists are worried about being misrepresented by the journalist and ungrateful to the community of scientists around them that all have contributed to this. And yet they also need to understand or need to help the journalist understand what is the news? What's new here? And, and why should I report about this versus expecting the journalist to work their way through it? There are also matchmaking organizations such as Sideline that scientists should work with and many journalists also don't know about them, but they're a matchmaker where I'm not just, I don't just find a meteorologist, but if I want to know something about clouds specifically to really find the right scientist for the question I have, then in, in many countries there are matchmaking organizations and if you don't have them in your country, it's always worth looking if there's a national weather service. Um, or if there is a large broadcaster that you can contact that employs meteorologists um, to help you with your research question. Yeah, those are great tips. Yeah, I, and I just put the sideline link. Um, and yeah, well, I'm gonna add a, a few more links too. And any of the panelists um, and Aaron, please feel free to, to add more links for, for the audience. Um, our time here is so short and there's so much to talk about. And we're already we're already at the hour almost. Um, so I wanna kind of, you know, pull out some of the big themes we've talked about. And, and these are things that, you know, that we, I feel like I've learned a lot from all of you on the panel, and I hope the audience has. Um, I think some big takeaways uh, for, for, for anybody, for anybody in the audience is um, there's a huge power of, of personal stories and in uh, telling stories that are, that are memorable, that are real, that are emotional, that are honest and generous and welcoming. Um, can really reach people in a way that sometimes the data um, by itself, unfortunately, doesn't. Um, I think we've we've talked about how every story is a climate story, um, and sometimes you know when you when you really want to get you know help people understand climate, it, it every everything we do, unfortunately, it's the story of our lifetimes. It's it's changing the planet in in so many ways, um, and it's important to. Uh, kind of help people understand what's happening, how the world is changing, how it's changed in their lifetimes and their own experience, and kind of refer them to that as a way to make it real and to be welcoming and to, and to make your climate communication welcoming and, and inclusive. Um, solutions, it's really important to talk about solutions and share the share solutions in a way that um, that is is honest about the the scope of the problem, um, but also that it's that it's not hopeless. That there are things we can do. I'm just putting a link into a, an article in Scientific American about how um, climate change actions are are really popular. Like everybody wants to do something, but at least in the United States, a lot of people think that they're alone. They don't realize that that that's. Um, that climate action is something that people care so much about. And I think that's frankly a failure of the media to um, to to you present things in in a way that that really does reflect um the, what we know about about public opinion uh and then action um you know the difference between issues yes these are very important issues but there are also actions that we can refer people to that we can help people understand um that uh that that are part of the solutions they're part of hope that are part of kind of uh helping helping you do uh what what your neighbors are doing and help them do the right thing and um, and then yeah, amplify good information. Um, you know, any of the amplify the work of the of everybody on the panel here um, on social media. Look for communities, um, share reliable information, share important information, things that are that are memorable and sticky and real and actionable. Um, just looking for another article about how it's it's not it's it's not too late and it's not impossible. 
um, I think there's there's kind of a persistent misunderstanding that there's a lot of climate change that's baked in and there's nothing we can do about it. Um, but that's actually not what the climate models show. If we stop, we drastically reduce um, carbon dioxide and other um, greenhouse gas emissions right now, um, temperatures will stabilize. It's we're not doomed. We can still fix this. We can't, you know, and people need to know that that uh, they can push for climate actions and that that's the, the world, everybody in the world needs that to happen. Uh, so those are some takeaways. Um, I think I'll, I think all of us would like to, to stay in touch with people in the audience. Um, if you're on the same social media platforms, contact us that way. Um, let us know if you have if you have story ideas. Um, apply for the um, apply for the um, uh, Wolfgang. Can you say an, again the name of? Yeah, I'll post the link. It is the okay, Oxford so Climate Journalism Network, and the next application window for journalists, freelance or employed, from anywhere in the world, uh, opens in within the next weeks. I'll just post the link here. Great, thank you. Yeah, and follow us. Listen, listen, listen to Abigail's podcast. Um, you follow good, good, good science communication, good cli climate information. Thanks for being part of of uh, of Climate Week, of Climate Action, of working towards COP. I know it's it's something we're all trying to use the energy and the convening power and the attention to um, to make a big difference in the world. And I think together with with everybody in the audience, um, we've got a shot at it. Um, so panelists, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Thanks to everybody in the audience and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. It's really good to see you all.